to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ be sober be vigilant for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour satan is no doubt aggressively pursuing people today who he can tempt and who he can destroy and what an evil ungodly adversary the devil is think about all the havoc that satan has wreaked on humanity since the very beginning you go back to the garden of eden and it was satan who tempted adam and eve to eat that forbidden fruit and be separated from god you think about the the calamity that was brought into job's life good godly upright man was tempted was persecuted faced the death of his family a dreaded disease why did all that occur satan tempted job and friend as i think about the calamity and the havoc that he's wreaked in life and as you do the same as i look to my own life and we see people and we see friends and and, and loved ones who are suffering because of sin and at the hand of satan it ought to make each one of us have a, a righteous anger be angry and sin not psalm 4 verse 4 toward the devil what can i do today then to turn the tables on the devil we welcome you to our study today of how to make the devil mad what would you do in your life if you wanted to make the devil mad and if you did certain things that would that would anger satan what would those things be today we're going to talk about how to make the devil mad and what kind of christian uh, qualities are in your life will definitely get the devil set on fire and make him upset and so we think today about this wonderful subject and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you'd like to have a Bible study, you'd like to learn more about the Lord's Church, please let them know they'd be happy to do that. Also at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in any way in your spiritual journey. If you have questions or maybe you've got things that you've been thinking about of a spiritual nature, go to our website thegospelofchrist.com. You can contact us there by email or through the phone. Get our phone number there. We're happy to help you in any way. From our website, you can also order various studies that we have that are free of charge, and we'd be glad to make those available to you in any way that we could. Let's then turn our attention to the discussion today of how to make the devil mad. If I were going to do things in my life, and you were going to do things in your life that we would say would definitely not make Satan happy. What would those things be? First, if you're a child of God, we want to encourage you to be more faithful than you've ever been before. Live more for Jesus every day. Have a sense of urgency to your faithfulness. Never stop putting one foot in front of another and never give up. More faithful than we've ever been would surely not make the devil happy. You see, Jesus said in Revelation 2 verse 10, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. By being motivated by God's love, it is the love of Christ that ought to compel us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that they who live no longer live for themselves but live for him who died for them and rose again in view of God's marvelous love. The great sacrifice of Jesus, be more faithful to God than you've ever been. I love the words of Paul in Galatians 2 verse 20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, in this human body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can we say like Paul, I've truly been crucified with Christ? Have we put the past? Have we put the old life behind us? Are we letting the world and its pleasures flee into uh, uh, the other part of our life and not take a big part in it today? And then are we really 
being a sacrifice for Christ every day. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Have I really sacrificed self to God? Have I really conformed and transformed my mind as I ought to? Like Joshua, we need the attitude, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We want to daily follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ everywhere that He would lead us in this life. And so to make the devil mad, be more faithful than you've ever been before. Friend, I will assure you, the one thing that Satan hates, the one thing that, that gets his ire up more than anything else is fidelity, complete faithfulness and dedication to God. Now that's what God wants, right? Mark 12, verse 30, the Bible says Jesus was asked, Lord, what's the, what's the greatest of all commandments? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The one thing God wants more than anything and the one thing devil doesn't want is for us to put the Lord first and really be faithful in this life. Uh, be faithful in working for God. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. The things that I do for God, those are things that are really going to last in this life. And so, are we really serving others? Mark 10, verse 45, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Are, are we doing what we can to help the poor and the needy and those who are hurting? Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Galatians 6, verse 10, Are we out trying to do good in the name of Christ and really help God's cause in this life? Am I working like I ought to be working? Am I faithful in attendance as God wants me to be? You see, the Bible teaches that God wants us to worship Him as His people. John 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Am I faithfully attending the worship services of the church? The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. I'll tell you what Satan wants you to do. Satan wants you to stay up late on Saturday night and get really, really tired on Sunday morning. Satan wants you to say to yourself, I've got a ball game tonight that I can't, is going to keep me from going to church. I've got this event. I've got work that's going to keep me late. I'm too tired or I don't feel well. Satan wants you to sit at home and not go to Bible study. Because he's afraid if you go to Bible study, you might learn something that will help you be more faithful. He doesn't want you to go hear the preaching of the gospel, sing songs of praise unto him, because he knows that the doing of that may prick your heart, and you might become more faithful to God. And so if I really want to be uh, the type of person that will make Satan angry, I want him to be more faithful than I've ever been. I want to be more faithful in following the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what I've been called to do, right? 1 Peter 2.21 For this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. Satan don't want you to stand where Jesus stood. He don't want you to think like Jesus thought, Philippians 2 verse 5. He don't want you to step in the path of Jesus, 1 Peter 2.21, and He surely doesn't want you to imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. But if you want to make the devil mad, you strive to make it your aim. Make it your desire every day to be more faithful in following the example of Jesus. Be more faithful in encouraging and strengthening others, and that'll help you to make the devil mad. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort or encourage one another daily, that's the idea and the mindset that Christians ought to have. But I'll assure you, when somebody's hurting, when somebody's sick, when somebody's dealing with a problem in their life, Satan wants that person to sit at home alone. 
He doesn't want anybody to call. He doesn't want anybody to help. He doesn't want anybody to go over there. He wants that person to think, I'm out here on an island by myself, and I can't do it. I'll just give up. But you know what? When Christians encourage, when Christians do call, when Christians do drop by to visit, when we try to lift one another up, I'll assure you, that's not what Satan wants in this life. He wants that person to feel defeated and deflated and feel like he doesn't have a friend left in the world. But then, as we think about things that we could do that would definitely make Satan mad, make the devil mad, friend, not only will being more faithful than you've ever been infuriate the devil, but giving more than you've ever given to the Lord will also make the devil angry. Now, friend, understand the way we're saying this. We're not today, we're not begging you for your money. We're not asking you to send it in. That's not, that's not the intent of what we're saying. We're talking about in your personal practical life at the local congregation give more to your the God uh, God than you've ever given before Luke 6 38 Jesus said this give and it'll be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over well men put back into your bosom you know what Satan wants you and me to do I'll assure you the devil hates good givers he wants you to be stingy he wants you to say, I, I don't have enough money. He wants you to not have the faith to reach out and help the Lord's cause because by doing that, people who are good givers are helping to spread the gospel, are helping the needy, are encouraging the poor, are reaching out in their communities in the name of God, and God's getting, Christ is getting the credit and the glory, and so Satan wants you to be stingy. He wants you to hold back. He doesn't want you to give to the cause of Christ like you ought to give. You know, when you think about the Bible teaching on giving, here's what it says. The Bible teaches that our giving ought to be regular in the cause of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, on the first day of the week, Paul would say, we're to give every first day of the week as we have prospered and as we've purposed in our heart. Just like Christians in the first century. Wouldn't it be great today to give regularly, weekly to the cause of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now friend, when we say give as you've purposed in your heart, that doesn't mean that you wait to the last minute and say what I've got left in my wallet. Uh, that's not designed just to meet the budget. We've met the budget, I don't have to, no. We want to give to God's cause because God has given so much to us. We want to be good givers in the cause and the effort of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, what kind of giver is it? What kind of giver is it who God is really happy with? Well, let's notice from our Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to listen to the giver whom God is really, really excited about. Listen to verses 6 through 7. This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, listen now, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, when we talk about giving to the cause of Christ, of course, the financial aspect of that no doubt applies. God has given so much to each one of us, right? James 1:17. every good and perfect gift comes from where? From the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. God has given us everything we have. How wonderful it is that I can cheerfully, that I can with a happiness and a joy give back to God. The devil don't want you to do that. He wants you to be stingy. He wants you to say, man, it hurts to put this in. I wish I didn't have to do this. I don't have enough money to do it. He wants you to have that attitude. That's not the way God wants you to be. God loves a cheerful giver. But you know, when we talk about giving to God, we're talking about on the local congregational level, we also want to realize that giving to God isn't just about our finances. Have you given to God more than ever before of yourself? 2 Corinthians 8 verse 5 is a beautiful passage. Paul holds up the Macedonians as a great example of, of cheerfulness and, and going beyond what they could in giving. And here's what he says about them. He says, they first gave themselves to the Lord. Giving means that I first give myself to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in us, whom we have from God. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Have I fully given self to God? Here's what the devil wants you to do. 
The devil wants you to be about 50 to 75 percent committed to God. He wants you to be about halfway there and about halfway in the world. He wants you to have a commitment, but he really doesn't want you to be fully committed. Because if he's not got you fully committed, he may have you right where he wants you. Have you really given yourself to the Lord as you ought to? And friend, I'll assure you, there's so many benefits. There's so many benefits to being a giving person. Jesus mentioned one in Acts 20 verse 35. Paul said, and remember the words of our Lord Jesus where he said, It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. What makes you feel better? Does it make you feel better to get a big present? Or does it make you feel better to give a present and to watch it light up somebody's life? To look at the good that you can do with your giving will make you feel far more joy than ever receiving any gift. And so we want to, if we want to make the devil mad, not only do we want to be more faithful than ever, we want to be better givers than we've ever been before. Friend, but let's also realize this. If I'm going to make the devil mad, I want to be more evangelistic than I've ever been before. Here's what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to be ashamed of the gospel, even though the Bible says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The devil wants you to think to yourself, my neighbors don't want to hear the gospel. My neighbors across the street or next door to me, they're not living right and they're not acting right and they don't, need, they don't care anything about the gospel. That's what the devil wants you to think. And yet Jesus said, Go, take the gospel. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20. Uh, the devil wants you to say to yourself, they won't like me. If I go to people and I talk to them about Jesus, they won't like me and they won't be my friend. And yet Jesus tells us the best thing you can do for somebody is take them the gospel. You're my friend if you do, Jesus said, whatever I command you. And so Christians, we need to be more evangelistic than we've ever been before. You know what one of the big problems that we face today is? We've given in to the world, we've given in to society, and we've given in to the devil because they didn't want us to say anything. If Christians stood up with one voice on issues of morality, on issues of right and wrong, on injustices to humanity and man, Imagine the effect that would have on the world. Why don't we do that? The devil's done a good job. He's made us think. You're afraid to do that. Somebody might persecute you. People won't like you. They won't want to be your friends. They'll think you're being mean or unkind. Friend, Christians need to be more vocal and more evangelistic than we've ever been before. Go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. As it relates to salvation and teaching the good news of Jesus, friend, we ought to feel an indebtedness to do that. Because of all God's done for me, I want somebody to know about the gospel. Imagine if you could, if you could cure some dreaded disease today. You, you just imagine this scenario with me. Imagine that somehow or some way you'd found the, the cure to heart disease. You'd found the cure where people would never have a heart attack again. What would you do with that? Would you put it in your back pocket and hide it? Would you sit on it? Would you put it in the back drawer? Keep it real quiet? No. You'd tell everybody you could about that. You'd be at the heart hospital. You'd be trying to find everybody who was struggling with heart disease. You'd tell your neighbor in the store. You'd tell your friends. You'd shout it from the rooftop. You'd want everybody in the world to know that. How much more? The power of the gospel, which doesn't save people's physical life, but saves their soul. The gospel is God's power to save. We have that. We know it. It's right here in the revealed Word of God. The devil wants you to feel ashamed and afraid and to be timid about that. And yet, we ought to feel a certain amount of indebtedness to preach the gospel to the lost. Friend, if I'm going to make the devil mad, here's one thing you can surely do. The devil doesn't want you to talk to God. He doesn't want you to read God's Word. We'll talk about that. And he doesn't want God talking to you. But the devil also doesn't want you talking to God. If I want to make the devil mad, I need to pray more than I've ever prayed before. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 7, Cast all your cares upon him. He cares for you. 
Jesus said men ought to pray always and never lose heart. Luke chapter 18, verse number 1. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. The prayer has powerful results. Hebrews 4, 16, God says, Come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Now, here's what the devil wants you to think. The devil wants you to say, God don't care about little old me. And yet the Bible says, God cares for you. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. The devil wants you to say, God's got too many other problems to worry about mine. And God says, let me help you with those. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. We bring all our anxieties and cares to God. Uh, the devil wants you to think, God won't hear anyway. And yet the Bible says, God knows what we need, even before we ask it. The devil wants you to say, I'm just not worthy. And although none of us, because of our sin, can claim worthiness of ourself, God loved you so much, He sent His Son to die for you. God wants you to pray to Him. The, the devil wants you to think it won't do any good. Oh, why do I need to pray? Praying won't do any good. Prayer, no. The Bible says prayer takes us to the very throne. Imagine this. Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. And then listen to Hebrews 4.16. God says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. If you could approach the very throne of God and obtain help, would you do it? Well, friend, that's what prayer does. Prayer takes us to the throne of God where we can find help to deal with the troubles in this life. And so the devil, he's going to do everything he can to discourage us. He's going to do everything he can to distract us. He's going to let the world get in the way, keep us so busy and so active that we just don't have time to pray. And yet, friend, you can't afford to let prayer slip in your life. If I want to make the devil mad, I'll assure you, approaching the throne of God in humility of spirit, in prayer, asking for His help, seeking His favor, asking forgiveness of sin, dealing with the issues of life. Oh, the devil isn't going to like that at all. And then we mention a final thing. If a person wants to make the devil mad, here's the first thing you need to do if you haven't already. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when a person's in sin, oh, the devil's just so excited. That person is a child of his. He's living like the devil wants. He don't have to spend much time and effort and energy. He's got his hooks in him and his claws in him right where he wants him to be. He's in his trap and he doesn't have to do anything with that fella. What about when somebody hears the preaching of the gospel? Uh-oh, the devil listens up. What's going on over here? Somebody decides to submit their life to God? I'll assure you, nothing makes the devil more angry than for a person to give their life to Almighty God. 2 Corinthians 6 teaches us about the urgency of that. The Bible says today is the accepted day. Now is the day of salvation. Here's what the devil wants you to think. Okay, yeah, you've heard the gospel. Okay, you're leaning that way. But, you know, you've got all the time in the world. Not so. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The devil says to you, put that off and do it tomorrow. You've got all these other things you need to do. Oh, no. That's more important. Obeying the gospel. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Isaiah 55, verse 6, God says, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the as heavens are high above the earth, so great are my ways greater than yours. And so we want to think about obedience to the gospel and really submitting our lives to God. Paul would say in Romans 6, 17, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You see, here's what it's like before a person, here's a description of what it's like before a person obeys the gospel. He's trapped. He's enslaved. He's ensnared by the devil. The devil has laid that trap. That trap is sin. That trap is called all humanity at one time. All men have sinned. And yet, when you obey the gospel, you've been free from that trap. The door's been open. The trap's been loose. You've been set free. You can now live to serve God in every way. I'll assure you the devil doesn't want you to do that in your life. And yet that's exactly what God wants you to do. And so friend, we want to ask you today, have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a Christian? 
If you're attentive to what God's Word says, and if your heart is really where it needs to be, and you want to know what God says to do to be saved, I'll assure you the devil is already starting to get a little upset. He doesn't want you to obey the gospel, but that's the very thing God wants you to do. God, the God of heaven, loves you and wants you to be saved. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Maybe you're saying to yourself, well, what do I need to do to be saved? Well, let's look to the Bible and see. To be saved, you must believe Jesus is the Son of God. John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Now, the devil don't want you to believe it. He's going to try to give a thousand one reasons to convince you that Jesus is not the Son of God. But friend, when you look at the Bible and you examine the evidence, there's no getting around the fact that Jesus is divine, that He is God's Son. Do you believe that? If so, do you believe it enough to make a commitment to change your life, turn from sin, and turn to God? Paul said in Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? He's appointed a day in which He'll judge the world in righteousness. There's a judgment day coming, and I need before that day to repent and get it right. Are you willing to turn from sin and turn to God? Would you acknowledge to the glory of God that Jesus is God's Son? Romans 10 verse 10 says, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And friend, would you, to become a Christian, be baptized in water to contact the blood of Jesus? On that first gospel sermon, when Peter stood up for the very first time to preach the gospel, they were pricked in their heart. No doubt the devil didn't want that to happen. They were pricked in their heart. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the answer. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We hope and pray today that as you think about this lesson, how to make the devil mad, that you will get your life right in harmony with the will of God, that you'll live faithfully to Him unto death, and I'll assure you, that will definitely not make the devil happy. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.